Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Kimberlyn Elliott. I'm the Associate Director here at the Lincolnville Museum and Cultural Center. Uh, for everyone joining us virtually, welcome to you as well. You're, we're streaming live from the Link Lincolnville Museum and Cultural Center. And I'd like to warmly welcome you to our second iteration of Fort Merze Speaks. So in celebration of the 25th anniversary year, the Fort Merze Historical Society has called upon a group of experts who have explored the history of the Gracia Real de Santa Teresa de Mose, the first settlement of free African American people in the United States. Through their efforts, the many threads of the Fort Mose story have been woven into a tapestry of understanding. They are here today to share that story with all of you. This is a story with so many elements, maybe even mysteries and secrets, a story that is still being sown today, and a story that will outlast us all. So the Fort Mose series speak, or the Fort Mose speaks a series, excuse me, seeks to reveal the threads that connect us all to La Florida, to Fort Mose, and to her people. Again, thank you all so much for being here tonight in person on Facebook Live on Zoom. And our talk tonight is going to focus on the archaeological excavations that have occurred at Fort Mose. And uh, we are going to go kind of by speaker, so I'll give each speaker a brief five minute period to kind of introduce themselves and talk about their connection to Fort Mose, and then we'll move into a kind of longer presentation where they can go more into depth about the discoveries and excavations that they've done there. And then we'll end with a Q&A session, so if you have any questions or comments, please hold them to the end, and us, or everybody joining us virtually at home, you're welcome to drop some questions or comments in the chat as well. Um, and so, of course, I'd like to welcome and introduce our panel. So we have Dr. Kathy Deegan in the middle, Mr. Chuck Mead, and at the end, Dr. Lori Lee. So, without any further ado, I think I've crossed all my T's and dotted my I's. So we'll start with you, Kathy. Thank you, Kim. Oh, it's Thank you, Kimberly. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the introduction. Um, and and I'm, my name is Kathy Deegan. I'm an archaeologist. I'm, I'm retired from the University of Florida, but I've worked in St. Augustine since 1972 when I was doing my dissertation research. And I'm here to represent the old for the past <laughs> of Fort Mose uh, rather than the present and future. And uh, I thought it might be interesting. Is there anyone here who is not familiar with the story of Fort Mose? I think most of us here by now know the outlines of why people came when they came and, and what they did here in building the fort. And I thought it would, it's such a unique project. I thought it might be interesting to talk just a little bit about how this came about. How did we get here? And how did Fort Mose become an archeological site? And it was really back in the early 80s when some of you may remember Bill Adams, who was then the director of the Historic St. Augustine Preservation Board, um, asked me to help out on a tour train drive for some legislators who were in town and wanted a tour. And uh, he brought up Fort Mose and we talked about it. And uh, one of the legislators who happened to be on that tour was Representative Bill Clark from Lauderdale Lakes. And he was completely fascinated. and. He really wanted to see something happen at Fort Mose. And, and I think in a lot of these projects, it really does take, no matter how much goodwill we all have, it really takes someone like that to spearhead it in, in a, a, a large uh, organization that can provide funding. And he worked on that for a couple of years, and he did get a state appropriation to begin the excavations. And that's really where I, I came in at Fort Mose. And we, we began our excavations there uh, in 1986 and worked for two seasons. And our job basically, I'm just going to, I'm not going to talk too much about the dirt and the features, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, we really were able to verify that the fort was in fact there, finding the moat and part of the walls and part of the tower. What we had really wanted to do was to find out more about the people of Mose. But uh, the politics in St. Augustine and in the capital at that time were, were um, delicate. And uh, the, 
landowner of, of the time was willing to sell the property. The legislature at that point wanted Fort Mose in the public domain. And there was a, a, a conflict over the value of the property. And there was a, a lot of fighting about it. And as a consequence, Fort Mose became the first archaeological site in Florida to be taken by eminent domain under the state. Now, the owner was paid uh, what, what the appraisers appraised the property at, but uh, it, it, we got kicked off the site as a consequence. And uh, we were unable to continue working, but we had fortunately uh, verified that this was in fact Fort Mose beyond any real doubt. Uh, we had money left over in the project and uh, we had another year's funding and so we used that to um, do an exhibit on Fort Mose. And I do have to mention two people, well several people who aren't here tonight besides Bill Clark. Um, Jane Landers was a grad student at the time. Many of you have heard Dr. Landers speak. She was here for the 25th anniversary of the society. and. Uh, she was a graduate student, and we had funds to send her to Spain to search archives for any information about Fort Mose, because at that time, the prevailing notion was, uh, well, uh, these people didn't, they weren't literate, and they didn't write the history, and there's really no, they don't have a written history. And uh, that was so untrue. She found uh, many letters written by people from Fort Mose, particularly Francisco Menendez, uh, and she found censuses, and we know the names of the people there, and where they came from in Africa. Almost all of them came from Africa via South Carolina. So that was really hugely uh, important for the archaeology. And uh, Darcy McMahon, who many of you have met, she's now the um, uh, director of exhibits at the Florida Museum of Natural History came to work with us in developing a museum exhibit on Fort Mose that actually traveled the country for 11 years. Um, Darcy estimates that probably 7 million people saw it, which I cannot figure out then why everybody doesn't know and talk about Fort Mose. But that's, that's one of the mysteries that Kimberly was probably mentioned uh, talking about. So uh, really, we, it brought us up to that, that point we knew the fort was there, we had enough artifacts and information to develop an exhibit, and, um, and, and that was really the, the uh, last act of participation the University of Florida had. And if I have, do I have another minute? Oh, yeah, have tons of time. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> one, one of the really interesting things that, that uh, some people have been curious about is the fact that you, you all probably know this was the second Fort Mose. The first Fort Mose was founded in 1738, and that was the one that Oglethorpe attacked in 1740 and uh, was ultimately routed by African and Spanish forces. Uh, that Fort Mose is uh, going to be is going to be reconstructed. Can I say that, Charles? Yes. <laughs> and. Um, so I think people are going to become really interested in it. And today, I, I know you can't really see it on the back of your program, but the color map there, it's a bigger one up here, kind of shows where we think that fort was. Uh, NASA, actually, when we were doing our excavations, was trying to um, declassify information and make some of their technology usable for the private sector. And so they agreed to fly this low multispectral scanner flight over the site to see if we could um, find anything about where the fields and the villages and, and all were. It's really, you can't really see it, but very close to where the second fort is, site is today, they uh, showed us, there's a red square. There are, uh, you can see a differential, it, it's a deeper area apparently uh, in the exact size and shape of the first Fort Mose, which was supposed to be very close to the second. So we have a pretty good idea about it, but uh, it's kind of under the water mostly, but then sometimes when the tide goes out, it's just mud, and um, Chuck Mead here uh, is the guy, or uh, will have some more ideas probably about 
how that might, if it's even possible, to look for it. But the other image on here that you might want to come up and look at is a map in the upper right corner. It's the Olano map made in 1740 by a Spaniard. And it shows and describes that first Fort Rosé very specifically. And it's very interesting. It shows where the fields around the site were. Um, and it describes um, the, the building itself, which is how we know what it, what it looked like. Um, unfortunately, today, uh, and I know that Lori and Chuck will both speak to this, the um, fields, the areas surrounding Fort Jose uh, have been severely dredged, and uh, probably, well, we know by Henry Flagler, in order to find fill, to fill in Maria Sanchez Creek and parts of Cordova Street. And um, he, Tom Graham has actually found the records of his purchase of some farms in that area, so it's, it's pretty clear that's what happened. And on the aerial, you can see the ridges of where the, uh, where the dredging operation was, and it's you know, everything pretty much except for the fort. And I always wondered why Henry Flagler left that one piece undredged. Thank goodness. <laughs> right. Either he knew or he knew about Fort Jose, or um, it was just too hard to dredge because it's a very solid shell midden. Uh, and as, as Lori probably will tell you, the site has been occupied for some 1,500 years on and off. And Fort Jose only is a very narrow little band, maybe 10 centimeters or less thick in a, about a meter and a half deposit. So it's very, very delicate, time-consuming work. Uh, so if you look again, there's a, a, a little drawing that shows where we think the Fort Mose occupation was in our dig. And the contour map we did of the site that showed where the walls are. And you can see that one of the corners is gone. But as I said, our, our real interest in this was knowing more about the people of Fort Mose, what it was like to be there, um, all those kinds of details, uh, although we were really happy to find the fort. Uh, and so that really finishes the past, and uh, now it's on to the future and the present <laughs> with uh, Jack and Lori. And it's already on, so you can just Oh, yeah, we have our own. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Chuck Mead. I am, I have to say, very honored uh, to be here on the same stage with Kathy Deegan and Lori Lee, uh, who between them know a lot more about Fort Jose than I do, but it, it's certainly uh, been a very interesting uh, project for me. And I was involved uh, last summer uh, when uh, Dr. Lee's uh, field school was told that they could no longer walk through the marsh uh, by the state park because there was a worry about impact to the wetlands. Uh, we were able, uh, because I'm at LAMP, uh, at the St. Augustine Lighthouse and Maritime Museum, and we're pretty good with boats, uh, we were able to get everybody out there uh, by water. Uh, and while we were waiting for our permits, because we are planning to do underwater excavations at Mose, uh, we were able to help uh, directly in uh, and do, do some archaeology on land, and we found that we were given a nice amphibious unit, uh, a, a, an archaeological unit that spanned uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the part from terrestrial to maritime. So we were in a part of the site that has been eroded, and uh, when we started digging, we were above the water table, and we kind of quickly got uh, to the water table, and we'll continue that. Oh, and, and uh, we have a... a uh, on your uh, bottom right, uh, you'll see a, a makeshift ladder uh, that we rigged into a platform so that we could uh, safely move archaeologists over that kind of a muddy area because we're already worried about erosion uh, and that, uh, you know, just moving around there could exacerbate that and uh, be problematic. Um, uh, that's certainly one of the things that we are focusing on that we are thinking as underwater archaeologists uh, we know, if you look at the footprint of the fort uh, that Dr. Deegan uh, had uh, identified uh, in, during her excavations, uh, a good bit of that fort is now in the water. Uh, and so we will be the first archaeologists to do 
underwater archaeology at Fort Mose, and we're very curious to see uh, what what we're going to find. I, I can't wait <laughs> to get out there, and we're planning to dig a number of archaeological units. Uh, but we should, we could very easily find things that used to be uh, in the terrestrial context that have now been redeposited as uh, the site is being worn away. And we're certainly quite curious as to uh, what will survive. Uh, it, it very well may be that we have uh, artifacts that survive even better than they do in a terrestrial context. Uh, that's very typical in an underwater site. Uh, you can have organic artifacts and things like that. Uh, and we certainly see Fort Mose as a maritime site, uh, which is maybe a different way than some folks have, uh, have thought about uh, Fort Mose. Uh, but it is, if you look at the top picture, uh, you know, we are approaching Fort Mose by water. You know, that wasn't probably a typical way to get for, to Fort Mose. It would have been faster uh, sailing there uh, and approaching by what's now known as Robinson Creek uh, than it would have been to go by land, and you could certainly get more stuff there if you had to get a lot of supplies uh, to Fort Mose. You could get a lot uh, on uh, boats, on big flat boats or something like that, or canoes uh, that would have been common at the time. Uh, and, and of course, it's on the water, so these people would have lived, uh, you know, followed a maritime subsistence. Uh, we know that uh, from the excavations uh, that you did. Uh, there's a lot of uh, you know, maritime species that were found uh, in, uh, among uh, the fauna material. Uh, so that's not a surprise. Uh, it may be an underappreciated fact that uh, many of the Africans that were brought across the Atlantic Ocean uh, had been mariners uh, in West Africa. Uh, there were a lot of fishers. There were a lot of uh, canoe building, uh, canoes for the inland rivers and canoes uh, on the offshore. Uh, for fishing and things like that. Uh, and then when these people were enslaved and worked in plantations, there's a lot of maritime activity on plantations that may not be appreciated as, uh, by us today because today everything is so focused on roads and highways and cars. Uh, but you know the rivers were the highways uh, in, in this time. And so the people who uh, resisted slavery and escaped to Spanish Florida and settled in Mose would have been no strangers to watercraft uh, and how uh, to make a, a, a living uh, on a river and on a creek. Uh, and so we're really interested uh, to see what kinds of things uh, we may find. Uh, the idea of uh, you know the potential of doing underwater archaeology at Fort Mose is not new. Uh, I remember gosh, more than uh, many years ago, uh, when I was at FSU, I found a paper by uh, a student uh, that was written in 1976. I don't know if you remember uh, Larry Kruger. Sure. Uh, so yeah, so I, I've never met Larry, but I've read his paper, and he had written a proposal uh, to do a joint terrestrial and maritime survey uh, to find and confirm the location of Mose. And, and so we'll, we'll be, you know, maybe doing some of the same techniques uh, that he had proposed, using a magnetometer uh, to find the remains of iron that might be in the waterway, uh, just having divers swim uh, and visually inspect uh, what's below the water, the, the, you know, the equivalent of surface collection of archaeological finds, or maybe things sitting right there on the surface. And then, of course, we're going to uh, do some excavation units. And uh, I think that's particularly exciting uh, to me, is that we'll be working side by side uh, and this is starting in May, so coming up, we're working side by side uh, with uh, Lori and our other colleagues who will be digging uh, terrestrially, and we'll be uh, mimicking those techniques and procedures as best we possibly can underwater so that we'll have kind of a seamless uh, excavation that spans both the water and the land. So we're pretty excited. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly excited. Uh, to, to see what the results will be and the fact that we'll all you know, be doing this as a team and our work won't stop as mine often does at, at the water's edge because we like to stay wet and their stops at the water's edge because you know they don't necessarily like to get any more money than they already are <laughs> working out, out of the mosaic. Uh, so that's certainly what I am uh, I'm excited about and looking forward to and you'll all be hearing a lot more about it uh, after next summer. So, oh, and I'm 
not, I don't have to pass this to you. You have your own. <laughs> yep, don't. Go ahead, Lori. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I'm probably the quietest, so if you can't hear me in the back, just let me know and I'll work on projecting. Um, so I am Lori Lee, and I am an, also an archaeologist, and I teach at Flagler College. Um, and like Kathy, I don't understand how everyone doesn't know about Fort Mose, but because of Kathy, I do know about Fort Mose. So I am also very honored to be here with Kathy and Chuck, and very grateful to be um, brought here by the Formosa Historical Society and Lincolnville Museum. So um, we very much see this as a collaborative project among all of us. Um, so that is really um, how I ended up working on this project. Uh, I was hired at Flagler College to grow the anthropology program, but they were particularly interested in the work that I did because I do community-based projects, and so in Virginia, I was working on a community-based project um, at a former plantation and working with descendants of enslaved people who had lived there, um, and working on other projects in the community, the Ann Spencer Museum, for instance. So when I came here for the interview, I knew because of Kathy's work and Jane's work and um, one of Kathy's students, Teresa Singleton, who was my dissertation advisor, um, I knew how important Fort Mose was, so uh, I knew if I may never make it back here, I was going to Fort Mose. So I made it out there for my interview, and then I got here, and I'm like, how can I do a community-based project? Um, and that's, you know, how I quickly learned at, at Lincolnville, all of the amazing things going on here, the ties between Lincolnville, um, the tensions with Flagler College across the street, uh, Flagler College, um, Henry Flagler dredging the land at Fort Mose and redepositing it under Cordova Street. So all of these connections, um, I really wanted to explore Fort, Fort Mose to know how to make that possible as a faculty member with a minor <laughs> and not a lot of resources. Well, but archaeologists are good at working around problems like that. So, um, and we do that because we work with our colleagues and our friends. So um, I was able to ask other folks, hey, can I borrow your transit? Can I do this? And so I developed a partnership with um, James Davidson at University of Florida, and one of his graduate students at the time, Liz Iberola, who's now uh, at the University of Texas. Um, so the three of us are co-PIs on this project that we started in 2019. And what we really wanted to do is go back out to Fort Mose and investigate more about the lives of the people who lived and worked out there. Uh, as Kathy said, they kind of got kicked off the site summarily due to politics, um, but we're in a different era, so we wanted to see if we could get back out there and go out to the site. So we did. We, um, we created a collaborative field school that drew upon students from UF and Flagler College, so we were able to get a sizable group. Um, we relied heavily on our colleagues at LAMP to help us get all of our equipment out to the site. And then um, in that first year, we walked out to the site every day and back um, with the promise that we would look for boats to get to the site in 2021. And we really hoped that maybe the parks would change their mind about that. Um, <laughs> turns out they did not change their minds about that. And the field school got canceled three different times um, and moved, was moved to second summer because of COVID. Um, but ultimately, um, these folks came through for us yet again, and we were able to get out to the site every day, and that's saving us $30,000 a year, right, and getting out to the site. Um, there's still some complications with accessing the site by boat, so we had a lot less actual time on the island as a result of that. Um, so part of this, in terms of the images that you see here, the one on the bottom left is from 2019. This was an excavation unit that is just a couple of feet um, from the image on the right. So we wanted to investigate the lives of people out here, get as much information as we could, partly because of climate change and how this site is being affected by climate change. So we want to get this information before there is additional erosion, and that's part of what the LAMP project is. They've gotten some funding to look at impacts of hurricanes and climate change um, and human impacts. So the erosion that was accelerated by Henry, Henry Flagler's dredging has really taken off that um, southwest corner of the fort. Uh, so where we're working in these bottom two images is just inside of that. 
um, and trying to get a sense of, of what remains. And we're finding some really exciting results. Um, the top middle image on the right uh, is one that Kathy put together that shows you how deep these units are. Um, what you can't see in this picture is how much labor it takes to dig through the, uh, those materials because we do it very systematically. And yes, we dig square rectangular holes, uh, but it's because we want to know where everything was in relationship to everything else. So context is critically important for us to understand time period. And if we can understand time period, we can understand who. So as Kathy was saying, that time period where 1752 to 1763 is not a big slice of um, stratigraphy. So we have to really be careful with our methods to make sure we don't go right through that, right? Um, we know that the site was occupied um, ephemerally during the, it was reoccupied the second Spanish period and then the British period, there were some Menorcans at the site. So we're finding evidence of those stories as well. Um, and um, so part of what we're doing out there in, when we went back in 2021 was uh, 20, 2019 was about figuring out where the original grid system was and setting up our excavation units based on where Kathy and her students found a lot of domestic materials. So we wanted to build on the work that they had already done um, and find more evidence of domestic um, artifacts because it would have been used in households and structure, structural evidence. So we we're finding some posts and there's a feature in this image on the bottom left that we're still not quite sure exactly what it is. It dates to this second Spanish period. Um, it may have had to do with, um, they renovated the fort at that time and in placed new cannons there. It could be related to that. Um, we're still analyzing um, the materials from, the, from that feature. So part of what we're doing is trying to get a better sense of um, how many households were inside the fort, um, what were lives like. And we've found material evidence of that. Um, as I said, it's very critical that we go through and look at the exact layers. And then also we're trying to use the ceramics to understand um, interaction, inter intercultural inter interaction at the site. So looking at the indigenous ceramics. So um, we certainly have the indigenous ceramics that were in use in the colonial period. And we have a couple of types that are, are not identified and we're hoping we can uh, those might be a key to understanding about interaction of particular cultures at the site uh, or in within St. Augustine at the site. So that remains to be seen. So um, we plan to go back out this year. Um, and another thing that we're doing, our original vision in 2019 included, again, a community-based focus. So we wanted to um, think about who all the stakeholders are involved in this project. and. Um, do some interviewing. So we applied for a grant. We got an American Battlefield Protection Program grant for our field school for this year and for next year. And those funds we're using to help um, pay for five people to come and work on the site um, and in an effort to try and make archaeology more accessible to more people who wouldn't be able to attend because of the costs of tuition and the costs of housing. So we have housing, again, thanks to our partnership with LAMP. Um, they have a house that they're willing to let us use for that time frame. So um, there are five positions, and I can share that link with you if you know some folks who might be interested in coming and, and participating and learning how to do archaeology. And they get paid um, a small stipend for that as well. So we're very excited about that. Um, we've been talking with um, Lincolnville Museum as well about um, oral histories that we would like to conduct with people who've been involved with the project over all these years, 25th anniversary. Um, so we would like to document those and then make those available um, through uh, Lincolnville Museum. So those are some of the things that we're working on now. Um, and we haven't, look at us, for archaeologists, we haven't even talked about objects at all. But um, we have found a lot of material objects, too, and that's one of our goals. Um, we know that um, the, when the land was private land, then the objects that were found there belonged to the family. Uh, and the family has lent some of those objects to the museum, but not all of them. And so we wanted to really also build upon a repository of material objects of the people who lived and worked at Fort Mose, 
because they're such critical touchstones for people. I went to, I see your sweatshirt, the National Museum of very proud Amer of African American history and culture. Such an incredible space. If you have not been there, go. And if you go before you go, reserve your tickets because <laughs> you will show up and you will not get in unless you do like I do and cry. <laughs> and if you cry, it's like, I have been trying to get in here for two years and I'm here from Florida. They might take pity on you. So that's your tip B. Um, you should have tried that. Uh, so I got in and one of the things, and of course I noticed is as an archaeologist, it's such a powerful, powerful, powerful place. Um, and archaeology has a critical role in that space. You see the work of a lot of archaeologists out there, and it's because of the, the power of those material touchstones of actual ancestors of people. Um, so I think those are really important. We see people coming from all over to St. Augustine to visit Fort Mose because it is such a critically important and unique place. Um, and when they get there, those objects, I think, are really powerful for them to, to be able to see, oh, this was something that somebody used, and this was how they used it, and what does this tell me about their lives? So um, one of my um, favorite objects, because it tells stories, is um, that we found in 2019 in, in the unit next to the one they're digging in um, on the bottom left there is um, the bottom half, well, a third of a, a Robert Turlington's patent medicine bottle. And that patent medicine was called balsam of life, right? And um, so patent medicines, what people would do is patent the bottles so they wouldn't have to reveal the ingredients that are inside of them so people couldn't copy them. So it's a really uniquely shaped bottle and the spelling of balsam is B-A-L-S-O-M, which they did for the overseers, mar overseas market. Um, and so that particular type is datable to 1754. So again, in our time frame, 1752 to 1763, we've got this bottle that was manufactured in that time period. Doesn't mean it was used in that time period, but it looks like it's from that time period based on the context in the ground. Um, and we know that after the first fort um, was torn down and people moved into the city, one of the reasons why they didn't want to go back out to Fort Mose is they complain about bad health there. And here you have this object associated with trying to improve health. So um, those are, that's an example of the kinds of things that we're finding. So we're very excited about this project and, and being involved with it. And again, um, looking forward to sharing more details with you as often as you like and uh, whatever format. Um, we're working towards creating an Omeka page too that we can put information into so we can share that with you as well. So um, I will stop talking. <laughs> no, that was great. Um, I, I agree that having those physical objects to be able to look at and relate to and think about how they interact in the everyday life of the people who lived at Fort Mose is super important. So it's really great that there are still things that survive that we can kind of look at and relate to. So thank you, each of you. That was great. It was nice to get a different facet of what you all have uncovered at Fort Mose. And so now, it's the opportunity for you all, my lovely audience at home and here in the room, if all my papers don't fall on the ground, to ask a question. So, do you have a question? Okay, you can come up and use my mic and stand right here. <laughs> here you go. You can yell. <laughs> come a little Sorry. toward this way. There we go. Hello, uh, thank you all for speaking. I was wondering if, over the course of your excavations, it would be possible for us, the, the great unwashed, to see anything that you have found online. And I imagine not everything is going to be visible for everybody until some future point, but is it part of your plan to make things visible remotely, just to keep us all fascinated? Absolutely, um, that's a very good question. And yes, again, is to create a community-based project and, and not share the results. Is, <laughs> it seems not very community-oriented. Um, so one of the things that we're doing um, is we're coordinating with the Digital Archaeological Archive of Comparative Slavery, which is based in Charlottesville. Um, and they have a standardized system that they use to catalog materials 
so that everything in the database is comparable, comparable to everything else in the database. Um, so I have a fellowship to go up there, tapping on the table, I have a fellowship to go up there um, later in the summer to um, start cataloging the Fort Mosaic materials into that. And that database, that is open source. That's anybody has access to it. So you, you have access not only to you know, just to see the objects, but the, they take pictures of some of them, but also all of the data associated with them, like the size, the color, all that information. And then you, you can use that for any kind of research that you want to do. So we're working on that. And then I'm also trying to, uh, working with the Flago student to create this Omeka page, which is like a virtual exhibit. But I just want to be sure that I do that in concert with Fort Mose Historical Society and with the state um, to make sure that anything that's in there is something that everybody agrees should be in there. I don't want to publish something that, uh, that people feel is, is sacred or shouldn't be included, right? So, yes. Thank you. Yeah, and, and that will include... Oh, yeah, yeah. If, if anything, that, again, anything that we uh, recover from an underwater context, uh, I mean, it's all the same site. So it wouldn't make sense if the underwater artifacts were separated in some way. Now, to some degree, they would need to be because if something's been waterlogged for centuries, it needs to be treated in the laboratory in a particular way. And we have those specialized facilities at the lighthouse. Uh, but uh, uh, otherwise, uh, anything that we find uh, as soon as it, it is safe to uh, dry it out would be part of the same collection that uh, the other archaeologists have. So and I don't know that that's uh, that the that database has any artifacts from underwater sites in it, yeah. so that'll be kind of fun. That might be another a, a, a new thing. So, and one one other important point I think to emphasize is that we don't own those materials, um, and so the twenty nineteen materials once we we get a year to process those and write the report, and then we send them back to the state. Um, so the work from that Kathy did that is loaned out to University of Florida. And the state, we're in, in communication with the state about getting the materials we excavated to be there as well, so that they're all in the same location. But when we wrote our permit, we said that um, we wanted them accessible to Fort Mose to be able to display them. So that was a part of our agreement. So would one have to sit in front of one's computer and contact the University of Virginia, or are there Will there be a link at Flagler at yeah, the Historical Society? Yeah, I can. What what I think the easiest way to do is um, uh, have that information available at Fort Mose. Um, there are QR codes that we can get that you can just scan it. Will take you right to that website in your phone. Yeah, so you don't have to. You can type in DAX, and I I've been working with those folks for many years, and you can see us. Took me a minute to. They changed the name somewhere along the way, so it's a long name, but it's d a a c s dot org, and it's a great place to find information on sites um, throughout the Americas associated with African diaspora, um, and in the Caribbean. Um, but most of those are associated with enslaved people, so they're super excited to have this one associated with the first free black settlement. So, can I add something yeah. to? Um, I know that. I've looked for things in DAX and I just type in the name of a site or the name of a pottery type I'm interested in and Google will usually take you there. And I, I'm sure if you typed in Fort Mose artifacts, you'd find, find it. Anyone and else? There are a bunch online too on the Florida Museum of Natural History site that you can see now. I've got a question from a Facebook user named Daryl. Daryl is wondering where the census archives for the Fort Mose residents what might be accessed. Uh, the original census is in the archive of the Indies, but it's published in uh, several places. Probably the easiest to find is the, uh, the book that Darcy McMahon and I did as part of the exhibit called Fort Mose, America's Fortress of Freedom. Um, it's from Florida Press, and um, it, it, it does publish details of that, that census. Thanks. Any other questions? Do you have to come up? <laughs> um, if you tell me, I'll repeat it just so everybody can hear. 
I was just curious, time frame wise, when Henry Feibler was doing this dredging, was it not widely known that Fort Mose 1 or 2 existed and it was potentially a place to be preserved and protected? Is it, was, it, was it intentional? Or I mean, I'm trying to get a better sense for it. Well, Fort Mose was known by historians. It wasn't something that was considered part of St. Augustine's historical heritage at that point. And I, I, I don't think anybody knew or suspected at that time where it actually would have been. That's why I was so curious as, as to why that particular piece of land got left left intact by the Flagler. So but Fort Jose was not really part of St. Augustine's conscious historical heritage until fairly recently. And there was some real pushback on, on identifying it and, be very curious to know, you know what, what was the motivation about avoiding that. Yeah, if too. it was um, altruistic or selfish or, or accidental. Yeah. If I had to guess, I would say accidental. Yeah. I mean, it could just be that you know the, the properties he had, he you know dredged and kept dredging closer and closer and closer. And at a certain point, he had enough fill, and, and he didn't need to go any further. Or serendipitous. It was in 1885 when he, when he did that. And he was new to the area as well. So, Thanks. One thing I found interesting as I've been reading more uh, is that, you know, how the understanding of the significance of Fort Mose has changed over time. And some of the earlier uh, uh, works by scholars who, who were aware of Fort Mose but it was almost like they were more interested in it as a from a military history point of view. Uh, you'll see talk, oh, well, there was a fort north of town, and it's almost an afterthought that it, it, that it was a, a black uh, a settlement that was associated with the fort. Uh, so it, it seems to have really slipped under the radar, uh, and certainly the, the fact that it's the first settlement in the United States of Africans who you know, refused the bondage of slavery and successfully resisted and were able to live, uh, you know, as free people. Uh, that obviously, you know, that resonates with us today, but it's interesting that, you know, obviously there's a long civil rights history in St. Augustine. Uh, it, it took a while for that, I think, to become part of the consciousness of how significant that site is. And as a Catholic, that makes me proud that it, you know had something to do with it. It's like you know, turn your life over and good service to your community, and you can live free. Uh, it's an amazing story, and it, and there were you know the Spanish did that in a number of other places as well, even earlier than Fort Jose, uh, but certainly in the U.S. that that was a, a new, you know, very new uh, uh, thing, and obviously very different uh, kind of you know, uh, racial relations in Spanish Florida compared to the, uh, the English colonies. Well, Thomas told me about Fort Mose, and then I went that day, and he goes, gee, nobody ever goes that quick. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have something you wanted to add, Kevin? That's fine. Well, to speak to your point, and some of the research that I was doing about Fort Mose, it's kind of interesting because, like, in the 20s, Earl Neil Hurston is sent to the area to research more about it. And so kind of in what she's looking at and um, uncovering, like some people know it as like a famous like promenade place where people could just like go out and have a nice picnic or something and then they leave all their trash. But um, yeah, just the, the human history of the site from Lori Lee's description of how long it's been and how short Fort Rose occupies is really interesting. Um, any other questions in the room? Yes? Are any of you going to be involved in, in any capacity for uh, in the uh, construction of the replica as far as historical accuracy? And, uh, 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 Jane Landers and I have both been working now for quite a while with the Fort Mose group on, on that particular reconstruction, uh, along with people in the Park Service, people from the Historical Society. So that it's... Um, and it, it, as if more research is uncovered before you know it's built, then that that can be incorporated. But yes, it's it's been a long process. Yes. Um, I 
Okay, okay may I ask another question? Go ahead. I, I just learned today, this morning, in fact, that there was another black fork, 19th century, uh, that the English had, they abandoned it, and blacks and the Seminoles occupied it in near Pensacola. The Gadsden County, the Fort Gadsden, uh, also called the Negro Fort. The Negro yeah. Fort is what yeah. I heard it called. Is there any effort there to do that which is happening at Fort Mosaic? I, I visited that site and, yeah. and it's really more of a recreational area and it um, uh, the interpretation is more about the War of 1812 and Andrew Jackson's role in that area um, and not the fact that it was manned by uh, black soldiers so, so much. Uh, uh, escaped enslaved people. Yeah, okay. Most, most of them, yeah. yeah. Um, there is a little monograph that was written about that at, by Florida State University. Again, if you Google Fort Gadsden, or, or probably you can find a reference to it. Yes, in the middle. A um, couple of questions. Um, first off, is there is there going to be any new uh, publications? I've, I've tried to read everything that comes out about it. Is there anything new in the works? And then, um, uh, uh, in some of the research I did in terms of St. Augustine in general, not so much Fort Mosaic, uh, so when they first came, that there was uh, uh, some people, some sources seem to say there was 50 African Americans uh, who came as slaves, and then I saw another number said 500 in another place. Is there is there any way to get to that? And then uh, the captain of the, of the fort out there. Uh, Menendez, or how do, you, how do you say it? Francisco Menendez. Yeah. Uh, seems like such a fascinating character, and I was curious to hear you say that he wrote letters, and I would really be curious to read those letters. Is there any access to that? I think you need to answer that from Jane's perspective. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. well, I can answer some of that. Jane, Jane Landers is actually working on a, a book on Francisco Menendez, and a lot of that would be in there. Great. And he was a very literate, um, well-spoken person, um, clearly had been well-educated, he had a nice hand writing. Uh, but, um, and did you want to? Uh, I was I was just going to say I know that uh, Landers had estimated uh, 100 uh, people in the initial 1738 uh, uh, for oh, uh, to, to start with. I, I was thinking of the um, when were you thinking were you speaking of Pedro Menendez de Aviles arriving? That's correct. They yeah. at, at the founding oh, of the city. In his well, sorry. In, oh, oh, in oh, his oh, slaves oh, came. Yeah. Well, no slaves that uh, are recorded, but his he had a contract with the kings. Expiration things were always very carefully um, uh, laid out, and he was he had permission to bring five hundred African slaves, but we don't really he didn't do that. Um, Michael Francis, who is a, a historian of Spanish Florida, believes that there were several, um, probably uh, black Spaniards on the, on the expedition, either as soldiers or, or um, servants of, of some of the officers. But the, the names, the specific names, don't show up until a few years later. But there have been, I mean, Ponce de Leon had a, a black soldier on his, his ship when he came in 1513, so it's, it's not um, unusual for Florida. Have you found any skeletal remains, or do you anticipate that? We have not. Um, and if we did, we would, of course, not excavate them. We would contact the state and let them know that those were there. and. Um, we don't, we would never excavate that. Um, but no, we haven't found any. It's an interesting question though, because uh, as Catholics, membership of, of, I guess, the parish, it's possible that they, they may have been brought into uh, one of the churches in St. Augustine, our parish. But I don't know of any skeletal remains. If they were there, they were probably bridged up. 
What about animal skeletons for food information? Yes, good question. What about animal skeletons? There are, yes, many skeletal elements of animals. And so um, the original work was done by, do you want to know that? Sure. Right? Yeah. Um, so uh, probably the most well-known so archaeologist um, so did really amazing work looking at what parts of animals were there, what kinds of animals. Um, and then we've also been looking at that, of course, at the, at the site that we've been looking at. So um, that's something that Kathy has looked at at a number of sites that she's worked at in St. Augustine and looking at how that's similar to and different from uh, what you find in Spanish areas versus British areas and then how changes over time and diet happen. And we found some really interesting evidence in terms of the access to the marine life. Um, but do you want to talk about that a little more? Oh, I, it, it was, um, the diet wasn't that different really from um, a diet that's been, been um, reconstructed from the same time period in St. Augustine. It had um, a lot more wild foods, which you would expect. Um, and uh, it, that all of that in detail is, is published again and easily findable in the journal Historical Archaeology. If you look up historical archaeology and type in Fort Mose, you probably find Betsy's paper. And, and back to your question about will there be other publications? Yes, we're oh, yeah. obviously we'll be <laughs> uh, working on some of those. Um, yeah. It, so archaeology takes time, as you've seen. Uh, so we we've written a report. That report that you have to turn in when you submit that to the state, and our report for 2019 alone was 233 pages. So there will be publications about that, but we would really like to um, process the rest of 2021, um, and then pull that all together and, and compare it with what was found before, and so we can give you a more comprehensive picture. But along the way, we'll be publishing parts of that. Yes, in the back. Have you done any geophysical surveys in our uh, ground penetrating radar? Uh, we didn't um, back in the 80s. The only remote sensing technique we had used was the um, multispectral aerial scanner data and shovel tests. <coughs> Do you plan to do it? It's possible. We're really, at this point, interested in LIDAR and looking at the LIDAR maps. So, the, so looking at lasers and um, looking at what lasers can tell us about what is under the ground and even under the water. So there's newer technology even available that we're hoping to use. And the city has to create LIDAR maps of certain areas already. So we can benefit from the technology that exists and the availability of those maps to see if we can get ideas about patterns that exist underground before even excavating. Well, this is a question. Are you guys, uh, do you have any uh, cooperation with the National Park Service on the police surveys that you do? So this is a state park. Um, so we work with the state parks on this and with state archaeologists, bar state archaeologists, but in terms of our broader discussions and our broader community relationships, we do, as archaeologists, work with folks like Ted Johnson um, and Jacksonville. So yes, um, yes, we do have collaborations, but not on this site because it's not a National Park Service site. But isn't the, the battlefield grants our park service? The battlefield, yes, the battlefield grant is park service. <laughs> um, so ultimately, there is that component, but it's not that so what we are doing for that is they're giving us the funding and then we will go and present that data and then we will be talking with other folks at other parks uh, in communication with them about what they're finding and james davidson who's one of our co-pis did the excavations at kingsley the ones after fairbanks did them so um, he spent i think 10 years doing excavations at kingsley so working on that site so in terms of um one of the reasons why I sought out James Davidson to partner with to do projects here is he was one of the few people currently active in the field focused solely on African diaspora sites. And so um, that includes Kingsley Plantation, Bilo Plantation, um, and now we're over here. So 
Um, we are working broadly with a lot of folks who have a lot of experience um, to make these fines more comparative across sites. And uh, the grant that uh, LAMP got as well as a National Park Service grant administered uh, through the state. <clears throat> so the, the National Park Service is, through those grants, uh, promoting archaeological research at Mosaic. Uh, and I will al also say, as to your previous question, uh, we have done some marine geophysical survey. Uh, we did a side scan sonar survey of the creek, the Robinson Creek, uh, back in 2009, which as far as I know is probably the, the first uh, marine investigation that took place at Mose and maybe the first remote sensing uh, or geophysical investigation. Uh, that would be interesting now that a good number of years have passed since then because we will uh, do another uh, sonar survey. In fact, today we just got a brand new side scan sonar that arrived and it's very shiny and beautiful. And <laughs> it's kind of like Christmas happened a few hours ago for us. Uh, so we can't wait to get that wet and we have all of our permits in place uh, for that uh, technology. Uh, our magnetometer, uh, which is basically a, a metal detecting device uh, that we tow behind the boat, that is being repaired and should come back soon. Uh, and then we are also, uh, we are expecting any day now to get a, a new technology, uh, a, a handheld underwater radiometer, which is a, even a fancier version of a magnetometer. So it very, it, uh, it's a very fine-tuned way to understand the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, and this is such a new technology that the one we have arriving is serial number three, wow. which is pretty cool. <laughs> Uh, and now that could be used on land as well. So it could find a concentration of iron uh, on, on land and maybe we could do some shovel testing or something from that kind of survey. And, and we have those permits in place. So, uh, so we're excited we could get started with that sooner uh, than our excavations uh, in, in May, perhaps. Uh, so we've got some exciting plans and some interesting technologies uh, as well. And I think, yeah, not to underestimate, the power and how grateful we are of having access to the money to pay for these things. Um, Archaeology is very expensive, and so it is partly through National Park Service funding that we're able to even do these projects at all. Um, and if you're not aware and you're thinking of other projects that are similar, National Park Service is funding a number of African diaspora sites, um, work at African diaspora sites, so that funding is currently available. Yes, go ahead. I've got a question about the future of archaeology. Yeah. What initiatives do you have to get more folks involved in digging up history? Because it seems like archaeology is the way to, for us to find out some things that we really didn't know about. And we need some folks that's looking from a different, certain perspective. So as far as the up and coming archaeologists, yeah, there, there are a few initiatives, and, and as I said, that was the reason for even applying for that grant to National Park Service, is recognizing um, that archaeology has been a fairly monolithic field in terms of demographics, and how do we, how do we deal with that, and what is at the root cause of that, and economics is part of that. So applying for money where we can assist people and having housing available um, so that people can become involved without having to overcome those additional obstacles. So that's part of what's happening. Um, and then in terms of uh, diversification and then just shifts in the field, um, we have a, through Society of Historical Archaeology has a really strong um, Society of Black Archaeologists working together. They have a number of initiatives. So I don't know if you've seen um, some of the diving that those folks have been doing, Justin Denevant, um, to rediscover the past, the work that they've been doing in St. Croix and the Virgin Islands, working with local community members, getting them involved in archaeology, community-based archaeology. So that's something here that FPN is certainly interested in, something we're very interested in, but given our requirement to get to the site by boat and being limited into how many people we can have out there, it is complicated, particularly at this location. The, uh it's easy to say that, to help you better understand, uh, Robinson Creek is very shallow. 
And so we have we have a large boat at our disposal that we could put 20 people on, but we can only get so close up the Tomamata River, and then we have to shovel people in with the small boat, a little 13 foot Boston whaler. And you can only fit so many on that boat, and so we may have to do five trips, four to five trips back and forth. Uh, we were very lucky that um, some uh, local residents at uh, Land's Inn allowed us to use their dock, so then that made access a lot easier. Uh, students and faculty could drive up uh, to that residence and then we could pick them up at the dock and take them back and forth. Uh, but it might take an hour of shuttling people before we can get all of the crew there. Uh, at my institution, at the at St. Augustine Lighthouse and Maritime Museum, uh, whenever we can, we try to get uh, any members of the public who are interested in what we do out there with us. So we like to get people out on our boats. Uh, if we can make it happen, I'll, I'll make it happen. Uh, if, if you're a diver, we have some local divers and there's a lot of diving standards that we have to follow. So there's physical exam and all kinds of training. But we have a few uh, uh, local residents who have gone through that training with us and can dive with us. Uh, but again, part of, you know, a problem here is just access, so you could only get so many people uh, in a day. Uh, we do have, uh, one of our volunteers has pledged that we can use his boat, uh, either with him captaining or it or one of us, so if we have two shallow drafted uh, vessels, that'll help us uh, this year. Do they have to be now trained divers, or can we be patty? Oh, you, you could, any, as long as you have a basic certification, uh, you'd be good, but there's a lot of additional training, and, and you can think, you know, Mosaic obviously is very shallow, so that would be pretty simple, but often the diving we're doing, uh, and that Mosaic would be very poor visibility, so there's just a lot of training, and a lot, uh, you know, we have OSHA requirements that we have to follow, so we have quite a, a stringent uh, system. Uh, that's common in university settings. So students from U University of Florida or from Florida State University or other places have entire semester-long classes where they would get their scientific diver status. And the field school that we teach every summer where we have mostly undergrad students from across the country, but sometimes uh, non-traditional students, uh, uh, which means older folks, uh, uh, they, they, you know, by the time they finish our field school, we get them so that they uh, are, are in the scientific diving When I system. was a young diver in Northern California, I originally trained to do bridge case on inspections. So I well, see, had those, adverse conditions. So. Yeah, those kind of skills we like. Uh, we, you know, when we met a commercial diver diver before, that's a, they, they bring a lot of that uh, experience where they're doing tasks underwater and they're in adverse conditions, as you say. Uh, but of course, a lot of you know people typically who uh, you know, go out and get, uh, learn to scuba dive, they're often diving in clear water in great conditions. And that's what makes it fun for recreational diving. But That was a previous life though, so. So, but whenever we can, we like to get, that's very cool. get folks out. Uh, and like, I'm sure it's like the same said, with any keep, of us. Keeping we, the next generation interested in, in this, so. Uh, certainly. I, I just wanted to also say that uh, we have a project that started this year at Guana, Talamato Preserve People of Guana which is to help them um, identify sites associated with African American experiences out there, as well as understanding and protecting, mitigating the erosion of indigenous sites out there. We have public days for that, and that is certainly open to people. So if you're interested in, in learning about archeology span or getting exposed to that and seeing, it's important to understand whether or not you like archeology span by doing it, right, Courtney? <laughs> so, um, um, and we love it. I think you would too. So um, you could get in touch with me about that as well. My email is lle -E at flagler.edu. So just let me know if you're interested. There's actually a wonderful maritime site up at, on the Tolomata River on the Guana Peninsula as well. And it's associated with Governor Grant's plantation, uh, which of course started right after uh, Fort Mose II you know, was abandoned. Uh, and we have uh, the remains of wharves and uh, hearts where they laid out logs uh, so that ships could be unloaded at low tide. Uh, and we found uh, a, a vernacular uh, watercraft, so a locally built boat, uh, years back, and we just discovered another boat, a locally built boat there. And so that's really, uh, you know, we're hoping, uh, we're doing more work there this uh, year, but we're hoping to uh, seek some more grant money so that we can continue our work at Mosaic and at this Tolomato site because we have two 
African American sites, uh, and they both have working waterfronts. So you both have this maritime aspect, uh, but of course, the, the first occupation is uh, free, and the second occupation is enslaved. But a really interesting kind of archaeology, and again, whenever we that site would not have the same uh, access problems. Uh, we could get our big boat right there, so it'd be a lot easier. Uh, and so we again, we, we want to get as many people involved as we can as well. Any lingering questions? Yes, in the back, and then we'll come to the front. Um, <laughs> I'm just realizing that I've evidently had my my head buried in so deep into other areas. When did you start this? That's why I was asking some the question I did. When did this all begin? All. Uh, well, I mean, I mean, the three of you were working on this project together with from the. It was a COVID era thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> for us at least. No, but it was 20, no, because you kept us in the beginning. So, oh, well, that's true, um, yeah. Obviously, before, before I would ever step foot out there, I, I needed to feel confident that Kathy was okay with that. Because, uh, not because Kathy, Kathy shakes her head because she's like, but if you don't know, and if you're not from here, you may not know that she is iconic and, and just the work that she does is, is amazing. And, you might also not know that she hates when I say things like that. So I apologize, I apologize for that. But, um, I hate it because, as Charles Tingley said, I'm just St. Augustine's oldest continuously occupied archaeologist. <laughs> I love it. I love it. But um, so I, I talked to her about whether or not she thought it would be possible and what would be the benefits and, and challenges of working out there. And logistically, as you've heard, <laughs> there are quite a few. Um, and uh, the picnicking that you were talking about in the 19th century continues into the present. And people do leave their trash out there still. Um, and then we find it. Um, so there is there is all of that happening as well. So there is there are human impacts to the site integrity that are also a complicating issue. But we all agree that it's a critically important site and that um, getting this work done while we can. I mean, ironically, we've got the underwater component, but we would like to get it excavated the terrestrial part before it goes underwater, because that kind of work is even more expensive um, to do properly, so. Um. Well, I'm, I'm really looking forward to see, you know, just to better understand what it means for this site to slowly go from terrestrial to an underwater context. So it'll be very interesting uh, to see that and maybe help us better understand what what will be lost, what we might want to be focusing on, what, you know, because, you know, they're very well, you know, there will be a difference between a redepositor context, something that used to be in, a, you know, a more pristine archaeological context and then has shifted to an underwater one. Uh, but how severe is the threat of the climate change and, and, and flooding right now to your work? Uh, so, again, we work closely with Florida Public Archaeology Network, and they have all kinds of public archaeology things that, if you're interested in, just look up Florida Public Archaeology Network. Sarah Miller is the director of the Northeast component. Um, and so they, part of what, of what we were doing out there, they had a grant, a three-year grant, called Heritage Monitoring Scouts, so they were training people to go out and monitor impacts to sites. So um, that was something that we went out there with them to monitor the site and see. Uh, and based on, so they have very expensive equipment, ferro equipment that will, um, to, that you take and stand in place and walk along the shorelines so that you can see how they're changing over time. And based on that, the estimate is it'll be underwater by 2100. I know you're working hard to um, continue the um, archaeology of the original site. How, what's the proximity for the uh, replica fort to the actual site in terms of uh, how close it will be? Maybe Charles and, and Thomas would like to field that. Uh, so the replica is going to be kind of behind the visitor center. I think there's some land. Did you go to the jazz series? Yeah. So kind of behind where the stage was, closer to the marsh. That's where they're thinking about putting it to the in the, the 
this four, and then the original four is, you know, out, you know, to the east a little bit more. So it's definitely closer inland. Yeah, but closer to this, they're not out in the marsh. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I don't know if everybody heard that. That was some uplands that were adjacent to the site that we developed um, the museum. And that's where the replica, a representation of me built. And I just thought it was ironic that when Fort Jose existed, it was the first line of defense for the city of St. Augustine. Now I look like it's the first line of defense for the encroaching waters. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, what, what an ironic situation. But anyway, we have some uplands where the red replica would be built, and uh, it'll last a little longer than the site of the, the fort. But before we conclude, I just wanted to say one thing, that if it had just been the archaeology at Fort Mose, particularly the early archaeology, I don't think we would be having this conversation at all today. And um, because for a long time, after the archaeology was done, uh, you couldn't really get there, and you couldn't really see anything. And it took, uh, it was the building of the museum at, at the site, and the acquisition of the property that the museum is on that really turned things around. And that is totally thanks to grassroots efforts here, the Fort Mose Historical Society, and I didn't get to mention them before, but particularly Otis Mason and Richard Twine, who went all the time to Tallahassee to lobby for that. And I think having a building, a physical presence that people can see and remember and have their picture taken with is uh, really powerful to, as well in, in creating memory. So I mean, I've just from my long view, I have uh, really seen that moment is when Fort Mose kind of took off. So thanks, Historical Society. <laughs> Do you have and, a question? And just to add that the reconstruction of the fort, I mean, to me, that seems it's going to be like a great leap for It'll be another great moment, like when the land was acquired and when the museum was built. There's going to be a lot of people, I'm convinced that are gonna be really excited to come see the fort. Because I'm sure that's a common enough reaction. They, they go to Fort Mose and they don't see a fort. Uh, it will become something that really attracts people who are interested in learning more about our very unique history here in St. Augustine. So I was so excited when I first heard that they were planning on building a replica and it's such a great cause. It's it's wonderful to see that there was so much support through through grants and I'm sure legislatures and obviously the, the local community. Uh, but it's amazing to see that it's happening and it's pretty exciting. And again, it's just an honor to be an archaeologist able to continue to work on such a wonderful site at what I think is going to be a really exciting period in uh, our our history at Fort Jose. Yeah, I was just uh, thinking about the next generation. I was curious if there uh, has been a Fort Mose presentation at the college, and if if there are any uh, minority students interested in the archaeological program or in Fort Mose, has, has there ever been dialogue? Or yes, um, that's a good question. So yes, there have been presentations on Fort Mose. Kathy has come into the classroom to talk to folks. Um, I have talked to folks. Um, and we have been really trying to foster that interest. So I do have a diverse group of students um, who are interested in the site. And I'm very excited about that. Um, and I will say that at, at the site, the past few years that we've been out, we've had a diverse group of students at the site as well. So not just my students, but UF and then my colleagues at UF and UT are fostering that as well. So that is our goal to really um, to make that happen. Oh, that's great news. Yeah. That, that's why their grant is so okay. important because it allows uh, you know stipend funding for students who might not otherwise be able to participate, and that's been a problem in archaeology. It's, it's not always the most diverse. Uh, your discipline of scholarship, so it's, it's right. good that it's moving in that right direction. Okay, I think we have one last question. 
question for actually for Dr. Deegan. Um, if I heard you correct, I believe you said you started this in 1972. That was your first step towards this. So that, if my math is correct, that would be you've been at this for 50 years. So yeah, you have our congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for that. Uh, so I would really like to know over the course of those 50 years. What was the most exciting or surprising or amazing thing that you've come across? Well, that's really, that's really hard to say. You know, you get so excited when you find anything that, um, <laughs> <laughs> that it, it's, it kind of runs together. But I, I mean, I think the project I'm proudest of having been associated with certainly was, was Fort Mose because it's one of the few that's actually made a difference in the life of a community. And, and of people, and very few archaeological projects can say that, that it, it brought together the community in a way that had really never happened before, so I'm excited about that. And we did find Florida's oldest orange on Spanish Street one year, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> the actual orange, in a well. Or in a well. Uh, what was the date? Tell us how old it was. Probably about 1730. Oh. Wow. I tried to get money from the orange industry. But <laughs> <laughs> Close Very Thank you so much. Thank you. Can we have a round of applause for that?